Hello and welcome back to the Code Circus. Today we are going to look at a really, really powerful feature inside of Python as well as uh, the ability now to do some really, really interesting things inside of the wizard world. So these two are going to go hand in hand and uh, create some really exciting stuff for us. So let's jump right in. So what we're going to do today is learn about creating functions. Functions are ways of taking groups of code and putting them together. So that way you can execute them over and over and over again and reuse them easily over and over and again. The other advantage that we have of functions is that in the wizard world, when we think about how that world populates and loads, everything loads at the beginning. So if you wanted to kind of create a delay, well, you'd have to put some way of triggering that delay other than when everything loads. And in order to trigger those delays, we need events. And those events would then trigger some kind of function. So until we learned how to do functions, we had no real way of handling events other than maybe the grabber event, which is, by the way, a function. We just never actually dove into the code of the grabber event. So let's talk about how to define a simple function. We use the word DEF, as in define, and then we create a name for our function, and we're going to use the snake case. Could be any name you want. Then we put in parentheses, which we're going to talk about those parentheses in detail in a little while. There's something important about those. And then we put a colon again to denote a block of code. Now I put whatever commands I want to execute in that function right here. So let's say print hello my function now if I run it nothing's gonna happen actually I have an error because I'm missing quotes there we go there we go nothing happens because we didn't call the function so in order to use any of these functions you have to do what's called a function call and to do a function call you just put the name of the function now, the computer will go up and look for this function based upon what's called the signature, which is the name and whatever parameters that we have listed here, but we'll talk about that in a minute. And then it will do and execute whatever is in the block of code for the function. In this case, it just says print hello my function. So now we've triggered a function. Let's talk about arguments. No, 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 not the fights that people have. Arguments as in values that are sent and received to and from our function. So when we send a value, that's called sending an argument. When we receive a value into the function, that's called a parameter. So two things, uh, two sides of the same coin, that's what I meant to say. So let's look at some code. Suppose I send to my function a variable called f name, as in first name. And then I change my print statement to say f name plus hello, welcome to my function. So it's going to look like the computer is talking to whoever sent their name. Now, when I run my function and I send it an argument, so the argument is Tom. The parameter is f name. So f name kind of catches the value of Tom. I'm going to clear this down here so we can see it run. And we can see it says, Tom, hello, welcome to my function. Now I can call this function over and over again with different arguments passed to the parameter f name. Um, let's say Billy. Jane, and we'll do something neutral, red. There we go. Tom, hello, welcome to my function. Billy, hello, welcome to my function. Jane, hello, welcome to my function. Red, hello, welcome to my function. So all of those are put in there. Now we can put in as many arguments 
uh, that we want as long as they match with the parameters. So if I have in here first name and then I also put last name, uh, L name, and I try to run it, I'm going to get an error because the function is missing one required argument. So I should have sent a last name to it for all of these. And now it says the first names, but it does have stored the last name as well. So the last name was sent to the parameter L name. And for each of these, we say McLaughlin is the argument, L name is the parameter. And the way Python determines which function you're talking about is by the name of the function, as well as the number of parameters that are listed. And if they match up, if it has a function by that name and the number of parameters match, then it will work just fine. Now, there is kind of a trick um, that you can do in Python that allows you to send what's called an arbitrary number of arguments. In other words, you don't know how many arguments are gonna be passed. And what happens is Python will end up creating a tuple of arguments, which you can then access the way you would access any tuples inside of Python. So let's give that a try. I'm going to clear out all this code. We're going to start again. And we're going to say define my special function. And we're going to send it asterisk kids because we don't know how many kids somebody's going to have. And we're going to print, actually, maybe we'll do a for loop here. OK, there we go. Typed it all up. So define my special function asterisk kids. And I'm going to say print the names of my kids are. And then for each kid and kids, print a kid. Nice and simple. Uh, remember, tuples we can address using the in operator, and it'll just go through and look for the number of kids, the kid in all of the kids' tuple. So when I run this and call the function, I can say my special function, Jack and Jill, and run it, and it'll send the arguments Jack and Jill to the kids' tuple. It'll create that kids' tuple for us, and then it will run the for loop and print each kid in the kids' tuple. Then I do it differently and say this time I'm going to send three arguments, Barry, Billy, and Bobby, and those will again be created a new tuple, and that tuple will also be called kids because it is within that scope. Once that function runs, any variables that were in that scope are going to be cleared out. They're going to be gone. They're going to be deleted as soon as the function is done running. So it's fine to use the same variable name. And when I run this, I can see... I get both iterations. The name of my kids are Jack and Jill. The name of my kids are Mary, Billy, and Bobby. So Python is able to discern multiple sets of arguments. So this is the only time where you can have the number of arguments not exactly matching the number of parameters is because we have this asterisk and it's only gonna work for our tuples. So we can also send arguments to a function using keyword arguments. And what's special about this is that the order doesn't matter. So when I call this function here, I'm going to print, uh, define my function child three, child two, child one. And then I'm going to print the youngest child is child three. So that kind of makes sense to what we've been doing. We have three parameters here and we're just printing child three. But when I call the function, notice the order. I say child one first then child two, then child three. It's reversed. But because I'm using this key, this key way of assigning the values, child one is equal to Emily, 
Python will actually look for the key at child1. It won't go by the order. If I did not have this child1 equals Emily, Python will go by the order. So this is an interesting way of using um, out of order functions to match the parameters that you defined in the function. When you might want to use this, well, it, it kind of, I guess it kind of depends upon um, what code you write. In this case, we have three children and they're sorted by age. So maybe every time you call the function, you want to make sure that the youngest is put in as child three, but maybe the person entering the names enters them in any other order and you got some kind of sorting kind of thing that sorts them by age, blah, blah, blah. So like there could be a reason why you might want to do that. So let's see that run. And you can see that it works. It says the youngest child is Linus, which is what is child three. All matched up great. Then we can do the keywords, but we can do it with a uncertain number of arguments. So let's take a look at that. So we could do something like this. Define my function. Notice the double asterisk this time. It says his last name is kid last name. So we're using the keyword L name and assigning it to this, uh, this list of kid and using that in order to get our, excuse me, not a list, a dictionary, sorry, it's a dictionary, receives a dictionary there, um, using that in order to get our person's last name. So the double asterisk is gonna give us a dictionary uh, and the single asterisk is gonna give us a tuple. We can also create what's called a default for our function. So suppose, for example, um, the user doesn't enter in a value. And rather than having our computer crash, we can put in, a, in some kind of default. So we create this function, but the default is assigned the value of Norway. So if they don't enter in anything, the value is going to be Norway. If they enter in something else like Sweden or India or Brazil, it's going to be one of those countries. In this case, here in line six, they don't enter anything. So the default is going to be Norway. So it's going to put a value in for us when we run it. And you can see that the default is listed there. So that's kind of interesting. Again, um, making sure that our function is always going to run, we could create a default. And that way we don't have to worry about the user sending, sending in wrong things. We can also send in objects. So something more complicated, um, for example, suppose we wanted to send an entire list of information to our function. So we create this list called fruits and then we create my function and it receives um, a food variable and it's going to map, it's going to know it's a list. If we send a list, it's going to treat it like a list. So apple, banana, cherry, my function fruits, um, apple, when we run this, it'll print apple, banana, cherry, because we're using that 4x in food, and we can see it prints apple, banana, cherry. So that's really interesting. We can send more complex things. But wait, there's more. This is really interesting. This shows you the power of Python. In the first call to this function that I have here, I'm sending a list. In the second call to the function, I'm sending a tuple. Inside of the function, it doesn't care whether it's receiving a list or a tuple because both of them use that iterative process in the for loop to access the values. So by using that for x in food structure, it doesn't matter whether it's a list or a tuple. So that makes our function significantly more versatile. So that's all for today. Next time we come back, we're going to look at how to send information back from our function. I will see you next time.